a tiny speck in a turquoise ocean, the island of Bonaire is a little coral sanctuary. Its clear waters support some of the Caribbean's best remaining coral reefs. These provide a home to thousands of species and protect the shoreline from storms. The reefs are also a vital source of income as Bonaire attracts divers from all over the world. The coastal waters around the island were put under protection in 1977, making it one of the oldest marine reserves on the planet. All marine activities are strictly regulated through the Stanapa Park Foundation. Its rangers patrol the waters to enforce the rules. The Bonaire National Marine Park is really a really special marine protected area because it covers the entire coastline of Bonaire. So all of the coastal waters around Bonaire, up to 60 meters deep, are protected. This means that activities are still allowed, but we have some special protective measures in place. And all of this is in an effort to preserve the incredible underwater biodiversity we have. In order to protect the reefs, Bonaire prohibits all anchoring and removal of corals from its marine reserve. A ban on fishing protects, amongst others, parrotfish, which control the balance between coral and algae. Thanks in part to these measures, Bonaire still has some of the healthiest reefs in the Caribbean. But like elsewhere, corals here are very much under pressure. Bonaire, like many places in the Caribbean, has lost a lot of its coral reef in the last 40 to 50 years. So as part of Stinapa's uh, mandate to manage the marine park, we do quite a lot of monitoring. We try to figure out how the corals are changing, how the composition of what we see on the reef is changing. Are we getting more sand or less sand? Are we getting more corals or fewer corals? Kind of getting a grasp of how uh, the marine park itself is changing. One of the big impacts of climate change is, of course, the oceans getting warmer. Uh, what we've seen in Bonaire over the last couple of years is a lot of bleaching that happens, but luckily not a lot of corals that died. Uh, but of course, if we keep having these really big, intense bleaching events and the corals do not get the time to recover, that can really change what your reef looks like. Today we are doing checks on some light and temperature sensors we have located in the park. So with these sensors we can get an idea of how the temperature is changing through the years. Is this temperature change the same in all of the marine park? Is it the same on all depths? And this can really help us in the future if we're planning on doing restoration by targeting which coral species survive best in which temperature ranges, which areas would do best for restorations. And the better we understand that, the better we can protect and conserve what we have. An organization called Reef Renewal Bonaire has been restoring coral reefs around the island for over 10 years. Our main goal is to assist the natural recovery of coral reefs using active restoration. That means that actively we propagate coral using different techniques. Corals that once they are grown up, get moved back to the reef. The restoration efforts involve multiple coral species, but the majority of work has been done on two reef building, branching corals called staghorn coral and elkhorn coral. Both species were hit hard in the 1980s by so-called white band disease and never fully recovered. We're focusing on these two coral species for two reasons. One, because they are critically endangered, so they need our help, but also because they have a very important role on the reef. They offer shelter to a lot of different creatures. They have a very complex structure. So in the moment you lose these corals, you also lose the fish that were living there and all the other marine creatures. Corals are colonial animals, which can reproduce both sexually and asexually. In underwater nurseries filled with trees, new colonies are formed through a technique known as fragmentation. We propagate thousands and thousands of corals in our nursery, just cutting them, like sort of gardening underwater. So let's say you have a coral and we call it the parent colony. You can cut a portion of it and this fragment is able to heal first the scar and then start growing. So the new corals growing will be a clone of the parent colony. In this way, cutting, uh, we're able to produce an old plant back to the reef, almost 10,000 corals per year. 
Although we are cloning corals, we are not placing on the reef or planting on the reef only one strain of corals. In reality, when the project started, we sampled all around the island almost 50 different strains of these two species. These samples were brought in the nursery and we started cutting our first generation, they were the fragments out of these parent colonies. But we kept tracking their strains over time. So we know exactly who is who. And when we all plant them back to the reef, we're actually very mindful. And we try to increase the diversity of those patches on the reef, making sure that we have multiple and different strains. Their genetic diversity may be the key to coral survival. Critics argue that restoration efforts may be pointless since both existing and restored corals are doomed in a future ocean set to be warmer and more acidic. But the reef renewers maintain that restoration can buy crucial time and hope corals may be able to adapt if we can assist their evolution. In the face of climate change, our work more than ever uh, is very important. We need to find corals that are more resistant. They are more resilient. They are able to, uh, when they're affected, are also able to recover. And that's why we keep focusing our attention also on increasing the genetic diversity of our stock. And we do it using a different technique, using larval propagation. And it's based on the sexual reproduction of corals. A few times per year, when conditions are just right, corals release their reproductive cells all at the same time during a so-called mass spawning. These moments are critical for both the corals and the reef renewal team. When the corals spawn, we collect the gametes with nets from different strains of coral, different genotypes. And then we bring it, the gametes to the lab, we mix it all together and we let nature do the job. So you will have million and million of eggs that get fertilized and start developing into embryos. And then we try to rear from embryos to larvae in a protected environment in dedicated pools that have been designed by our partner, Secor International. Larvae will keep growing there for a few weeks and when the larvae settle and is firmly attached, that's the moment where we can move the city unit, the tiles, and I'll plant them to the reef. The survival rate of the larvae is low compared to colonies formed through fragmentation. But each new larva formed through sexual reproduction has a different genetic makeup and may so become a pioneer for their species. Reef restoration can only have a meaningful impact if it's done at scale. The organization on Bonaire has just three members of staff, but they're assisted by a small army of volunteers recruited from tourists and islanders. I live in Bonaire and I'm a volunteer for the Reef Renewal Foundation. I got into reef renewal because I didn't want to see the reefs go away in our lifetime. And I feel like I'm able to give back by doing this in my free time. Uh, the cleaning team as well, at some point I might grab... All new volunteers are obliged to follow a tailor-made course designed by Reef Renewal Bonaire and taught by most of the island's dive centers. It's a day and a half course with three dives and it's a really hands-on learning experience. So they learn how to behave in the nursery. They learn about their buoyancy control in the nursery. They learn about how to clean the trees, to cut the corals. And then in the end, they get to outplant actual pieces of coral on the reef. With this course, we really not only want to teach people about the reefs and about reef restoration, but we also try to really get them along in our story and raise awareness that what we do matters and that we can have an impact. It's not only about the coral, but also about creating the awareness among the people, the, the visitors on Bonaire, that we have a reef here that needs to be protected and we can help uh, as much as we can. Visitors to Bonaire and the island's booming population do place a large burden on the small island. While the conservationists are rebuilding the reefs, a different type of construction is taking place on land. 
What we're seeing is that Bonaire is growing at an incredible pace. And so there's a lot of houses and businesses and hotels that are being built. And a lot of these are right along the coastline. And all of these can impact what ends up in the water. As you are building things and you're taking away vegetation, you get a lot of nutrients that will end up into your reef. Now for the algae, it's really good because since they are very closely related to plants, it's kind of like putting fertilizer on your reef. But the corals really can't keep up with how fast the algae are growing. And then you get a shift from a reef that has a lot of coral to a reef that is actually mostly algae. Coastal development pollution and the threat of new coral diseases all compound the impact of climate change. But Bonaire's reef restoration results provide a glimmer of hope. Over the past 10 years, more than two and a half thousand reef renewal divers have been trained here. Together, they've outplanted over 40,000 new colonies and have restored close to 8,000 square meters of coral reef. It's not only about the very positive result that we had on the water, but it's also the work that we have done on land, involving people, educating the community, and empowering people. We often talk about problems, but people don't know what they can do. And there is so much that can be done, and uh, one of the reactions that I have when people get involved in the project is the, the tangible result that they feel, because when they place corals back to the reef, they feel it, they see it and they see like their little reef uh, growing. To see the spawning of corals that you grew since they were little fragments and you spent a couple of years, you know, first in the nursery and then all planting them and monitoring them over the years and see them spawning, it's very rewarding. It means that uh, what you're doing is really making the difference. I'm still very optimistic about the future of Bonaire's reefs. We need to decide what we want the future to look like and then we need to take the steps to make sure that we can safeguard that future. If you look at everything in the broader context of global climate change and development and all these things that we are currently facing, we do also see that local actions can make a big difference in how a reef will look like in 10 years or 20 years or 40 years. So for Bonaire, since we have such a long history of choosing to protect nature, I think we are at the point where we can make those decisions that will make sure that in 20 years, Bonaire is maybe one of the only places that can stay while we still have a very nice, beautiful reef left.